So good morning. I am Guillermo Reyes, and I will be presenting uh, this contribution titled yeah, Use of Transfer Learning for Detection of Structural Alterations, uh, which is a work um, I developed uh, with my tutor, uh, Marco Antonio Perez, um, in my PhD thesis. Uh, we come from Universitat Ramon Llull, uh, which is a university in Barcelona. So, uh, without further ado, um, this work uh, is uh, framed inside uh, structural health monitoring, which is a discipline that aims to uh, answer the questions you see in this screen, which is uh, to detect damage, to detect where the damage has happened, uh, how severe that damage is, what's the type of damage, and uh, what's the expected um, remaining life of the structure. In order to do that, there are several methods, local, non-local, destructive, non-destructive. Uh, this work focuses on the use of non-destructive vibration-based uh, techniques, which basically is measuring the vibrations of the structure and using them in order to um, ascertain, to, to answer the questions uh, pertaining structural health monitoring. Um, it is important to see that since we're working with vibrational data, uh, we can classify the different approaches used in this SHM according to whether they are they use temporal data, which is the raw data going from the sensors, be it the velocity, uh, acceleration, or displacement, or in the modal domain, which is a uh, domain basically pertaining to the natural frequencies of the structure. We choose an intermediate uh, correlation domain, which is the frequential domain, in which uh, we focus on the data uh, derived from the temporal data, but passing through a Fourier fast transform. Uh, it is also important uh, to see this work in, in um, frame according to how it approaches data. Um, we have model-driven approaches, which are based on using a physical model and how that physical model uh, and uh, adjusting that physical model so that it uh, properly correlates with the experimental data. Uh, we have data-driven approaches, which are based on seeing how uh, the data structures itself and what data and, and detecting anomalies in that data, in the experimental data that we are receiving in order to detect damage. And we have hybrid approaches. Uh, this work is a hybrid approach using uh, models and also um, data um, statistical models. So why do we use, uh, why do we act in the frequency domain and not in the temporal or modal domains, which, which are actually usually more common in the literature? So uh, as we can see, um, this is a frequency response function, which is the response of the structure uh, to uh, an excitation uh, along these uh, 81 nodes. This, this uh, response function uh, corresponds to a 300 by 300 aluminum plate. And uh, all of those peaks are the natural frequencies. Uh, as you can see, those natural frequencies usually shift uh, when damage uh, happens. This is the damage corresponding to a crack that goes from four millimeters to 180 millimeters in length. Um, to compare these two um, vectors, uh, it's visually very difficult. And the temporal domain, it's usually even more difficult to correlate, at least uh, to us as humans. Uh, in our group, we have been working with the complex frequency domain assurance criterion, which is a correlation of these two spectra, a pristine spectra and a damage spectrum. Um, and that correlation um, basically composes this matrix that we, it is represented shows a very particular diagonal pattern that degrades with damage. And each damage has a very particular degradation pattern. And uh, we can use that in order to see what different types of damage uh, we uh, detect on the structure. That is mainly the aim of this work, to train a model capable of successfully identifying damage typologies from a pre-trained model. Uh, to develop a way of assessing how sensitive 
that model is and to understand what the model is doing and what can be learned from that understanding. So uh, we will talk uh, further about um, this uh, pre-trained model stuff. After all, this is a transfer learning application, not merely, uh, not, not simply AI. Um, so first of all, we have to have some kind of da data set. Um, in order to obtain that data set, we have uh, this 300 by 300 plate, aluminum plate, and we have uh, three scenarios, the pristine plate, the uh, plate with a crack simulacrum, and a plate with a stringer reinforcement. Here you can see the experimental setup that, that we used. The data was obtained using the Robin hammer method, which is basically using a hammer with a um, force sensor that uh, we use to hit the structure at each of the, those 81 points, obtaining 81 frequency response functions that combined give us the structure's frequency response function. Uh, Mother is, uh, as you probably know, uh, in order to train uh, an, a, an AI model, we usually need great quantities of data, and these experiments take a lot of time to perform. So we performed some, some um, of those um, experiments and used a pristine sample in order to adjust a finite, finite element mo uh, model that we then used to replicate all of the damage scenarios. As you can see, uh, visually, the uh, CF DAC uh, is very similar for the experimental cases above and the numerical cases below. Uh, we use only uh, numerically generated cases in order to train our model and then uh, compared, uh, evaluated the model, tested it only using experimental data. So it is very relevant to know that we only need a pristine sample in order to train the model and then uh, we can basically use that model for experimental cases, so real data. So how we do, did we train this model? Uh, this model um, was, the, the basic pretense is that um, in, in spite of what a frequency response function uh, is, this CF DAC is very visual in nature. So since we have a lot of models trained in the ImageNet data set, which is a data set that basically has thousands of categories, um, we can use a pre-trained uh, ResNet um, 18 in order to actually train uh, that model, adapt it uh, to our particular case mainly using the fast AI library, which is designed in order to just perform this task among others, but greatly uses the coding necessary in order to perform it. Uh, what we saw is that uh, when we tested the model, uh, watching for how it responded to the experimental data, if we included all of the experimental data, cases with very little damage, then the confusion matrix was uh, very much not precise enough. But when we restricted um, how much damage that um, uh, data set presented, for example, if, if we restricted it to only um, experimental data corresponding to plates that had lost 7.56% of its uh, stiffness and or gained in the case of the stringer 6.21% uh, of its stiffness, uh, then we see an improvement. And if we restrict it further, we reach a stage in which the model is practically operating at 100% accuracy. If we map all of these thresholds uh, according to accuracy, we get a graph like this, which allows us to simply um, know um, if we're setting the model to detect as uh, at certain damage or improvement thresholds how accurate the model will be finally in order to understand how this model is behaving we use activation maps these activation maps allows us to see which cells of the convolutional ne neural network were more or less active um, in these cases we basically have um, we, we can see which parts of the CF DAC and of 
which obviously corresponds to the spectra. So what parts of the frequency bands that we are using actually matter more for the model or matter less. And we can see when why the model is confusing some things. For example, the first uh, column corresponds to a pristine sample. The second column corresponds to a one millimeter stringer. As you can see, the CF tags are very similar and the model excites or, or uh, focuses on exactly the same parts, which are very similar in both models. And we also can see that the activation maps for the different scenarios are very different. The third column corresponds to a five millimeter stringer. The fourth corresponds to a 140 millimeter crack. And we can see that the model focuses on entirely different parts. And um, it is also remarkable to see that uh, we as humans would only, or at least we mainly focused on the diagonal and how the pattern degraded, but the model actually teaches us that uh, the parts outside the diagonal are also important. In the case of the crack, it's practically always identified mainly from information that's outside the diagonal. So in conclusion, we have successfully trained a model that is capable of identifying damage typologies from a pre-trained model, uh, therefore um, making it very easy to train and very and, and at a very small cost and it's it has been successfully shown to function with acceptable performance metrics uh, we have been able to ascertain the sensitivity of the model and uh, do it uh, in a way that we can replicate it and we have used activation maps that have shown us what parts of the spectral correlation are important and to identify uh, damage hypothesis and uh, why some samples are not classified correctly. Thank you very much for your attention. This work was made possible thanks to public funding from the doctor pro program for doctorates industrials. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be here in order to answer them.